we are talking about COVID-19 and the economy this morning, and that's why Tony Watima is with us this morning. Tony, welcome to the show. Thank you. All right. And just before I introduce the rest of my panel, of course, we want you to be part of this conversation. That's why we ask you on our question of the day this morning, how has, have, the, has, the, have the latest COVID-19 restrictions affected you or your business? Once again, how have the latest COVID-19 restrictions affected you or your business. You can be part of this conversation, by the way, by tweeting us at NTV Kenya and at Victor Kiprop underscore using the hashtag news normal. You can also follow the conversation on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. If you want to call in, then the numbers will be on the bottom of your screen in a short while. But yes, Tony Watima is an independent economist. He's one of my guests this morning. On the other side of studio, I have uh, Magdalene Moiruri. She's the general manager at Cafe Daily. Welcome to the show, Magdalene. Thank you, Corrid. All right. And of course, joining us virtually this morning is Mohamed Heresi, the chairman of the Kenya Tourism Federation, live from Mombasa. If you can hear us, welcome to the show, sir. Uh, thank you. Thank you. All right. And of course, also, we'll be also joining us in a short while is Mr. Lawrence Karanja, the chief administrative secretary that is in the Ministry of Industrial Industrialization and Trade. But for now, we have to start that conversation. And Tony, 2020 was really rough on nearly all of us, ex of course, except those who made millions out of uh, tenders and all that. But 2021 was meant to be the year of recovery. Um, okay. We, we cannot say that 20, 2021 was the year of recovery uh, because we're not out of the pandemic. Uh, the pandemic is the economic disruptor. Uh, and unless we solve that public health problem, uh, we will never say we are on a stable recovery. Mm -hmm. uh, I think what we, the conversation was uh, we will have uh, some little time to balance. Uh, and so we expected that you will balance the economy and then when there is a wave, you will slow down again. Uh, and that will be going for a period of time until you get a vaccine. And so much of the restrictions that were placed uh, was trying to not to overwhelm the... Uh, the, the health system that we have. I'm sure you'll agree with me that the general feeling, especially around February, January and December, was the worst was actually behind us. Uh, I, I think we, we, we lowered our guard down and we thought we were out of the woods, uh, but we were not. Uh, I think what many countries did is trying to put protocols uh, that will uh, control the, the pandemic. And then we expected by in January this year, a vaccine rollout will be there. I think uh, many pharmaceutical companies had indicated that uh, vaccines will be starting being produced uh, and distributed in January. And so that is where now we can talk about a recovery process so long as you have a proper vaccine rollout that within a short period of time you're able to vaccine a bigger population of, of, your, of, of, of the people in your economy. So that means that you are, you, you're building a recovery stage. Mm -hmm. But uh, the fact that we... For us, like for us, where we are in terms of vaccination program, we cannot talk about a recovery at this point in time. I think we are very far from that. Okay. Yeah. Let me bring in Mr. Mohamed Hersi. Uh, he's the chairman of the Kenya Tourism Federation at this point. Mr. Hersi, I mean, of course, this is our situation at the moment, uh, but it, you will agree with me that it feels like almost March 2020 all over again. <clears throat> actually, uh, it feels actually worse because... Uh, we had uh, started the slow journey to start a recovery. And then uh, the third wave uh, coming in, and with the, all the new measures that have taken place, it basically means that uh, travel uh, once again stops. The biggest trouble with the tourism industry is that uh, you're dealing with human beings and you're dealing with people who have to plan to travel. and. Uh, we cannot be sending uh, mixed sectors, but at the end of the day, again, some of these things have to be done, especially in containing the virus when you start getting uh, new waves. Yeah, so 2020 is not yet done with us. It's very much that 2021 looks like a continuation of that bad year, unfortunately. Okay, and, and of course, speaking about tourism and a bit, uh, the bit about being uh, about planning, then this year's Easter was once again the one that uh, the coastal region, which is known for tourism, had to celebrate without, you know, Nairobians. You see, Easter is just not about uh, Kenya coast, it's uh, the whole country. 
And uh, when I say the whole country, you have Naivasha, you have Kisumu, you've got the Mount Kenya circuit, everybody benefits from, uh, you know, t- t- domestic tourism, specifically Easter. And the what is regrettable is that uh, the closure came in very close to just a few days to Easter, which basically meant that uh, all the preparations, all the purchases that every hotel had made, uh, travel agents, all the bookings they had made. <clears throat> now you need to start refunding uh, people who had booked with you. Okay. So the entire Easter was wiped out uh, so easily, and the, the, here we are now today. All right, and of course the holy month of Ramadan is also once again uh, here with us in the midst of all this. <clears throat> yeah, Ramadan uh, has never been an issue per se, uh, because normally... Uh, uh, the, the Kenya coast is normally quiet uh, during the uh, Ramadan period, but you can remember Ramadan keeps shifting. So there's a time we used to have Ramadan in, in December, and then, uh, you know, like next year, hopefully it will come down probably too much, and then it goes back again. So it is cyclical. Okay. Uh, so Ramadan is really not an issue per se, but the biggest challenge is, of course, uh, COVID-19, uh, cessations of movement. Uh, we keep changing the... Um, you know, the movement uh, opportunities in terms of uh, what do you, would you allow and would you stop. Okay. International travel is very hard for it to work like that. And it's just not about Kenya. <clears throat> I can't really blame government here <clears throat> because it's something global. But there are better ways of handling it. And I believe uh, we are in discussions on how to lessen uh, the impact of these closures. Okay. Let me just come back to you, Magdalene. She's with us in the studio this morning. Magdalene, when, when, when we, we got the alert that the president was about to speak in State House, you didn't expect uh, restrictions of the magnitude that was announced? Uh, basically, it was a shock. It came as, as a shock to everyone. We never expected that we are going to go back to takeaway. Note that all our branches are in the CBD. Takeaway does not do good in the CBD. What happens at in the CBD, people come to town for meetings, and they normally meet in the restaurant. Mm-hmm. Now, telling the same people to come to the CBD and carry takeaway and go find a place to sit, it's next to impossible. Basically, we've gone back to where we were in March 2020. We were hoping that 2021 was going to be a year of recovery, but it's not. It's actually been very worse. Okay. And definitely this, of course, came at a time when things were starting to look up, more people were coming to town, more people were starting to be more comfortable again to meet with other people in restaurants. Yeah, exactly. Uh, As per 2020, as compared to 2021, we were recovering. We were actually at 80% of where we were in 2029, 2019 numbers. So basically, we've been thrown back to 2020. We've gone back to zero. At the moment, once uh, the president made the announcement, our sales basically dropped to 10%. We had to reduce staff to 15% and had to let some go for leave, okay. unpaid leave. So you had to actually let some people go home? Yes. All we right. had to go for unpaid leave. Okay. We will be coming back to, of course, the impact um, that means, of course, in terms of, of job losses. But again, people from the, the bars and, and the clubs and the pubs would argue that at least you guys can still open and, and get a few, uh, one person or two. But it can never be the same. Mm-hmm. Because we are looking at uh, losing almost uh, 15, uh, 85% of our clients. We are only having 15%. So... It's, it's not the same. Even if we are selling that one cup of coffee, it can never be, be compared to how we were in 2019. Okay. Yes. Uh, I, Mr. Lawrence Karanja, of course, is the Chief Administrative Secretary in the Ministry of Industrialization and Trade, has already joined us. Um, welcome to the show, Waziri. Quick one. If, uh, I mean, the, the expectation for many people was if we are going to announce such stricter restrictions it would at least come along with some you know uh, tax relief measures and the kind of stimulus packages we saw in 2020 uh, <clears throat> first of all i'll say this uh the government uh, it's not an easy choice whether to impose some restrictions or not but the primary obligation of the government is to protect life and therefore, uh, considering the circumstances and after consultation 
uh, the decision to, to do those uh, restrictions was for the common good of the Kenyans. Because we realized that uh, lives were being lost at an alarming rate. Our hospitals were getting overwhelmed. And uh, there is no way one can recover life. You can recover as a business. As uh, someone has said, they had recovered almost up to 85% after the easing of the restriction previous time. Therefore, I am certain uh, if we had remained open in a short while, they would be back where they were in 2019. But what would happen to those lives which were lost? What would happen to those families which lost their breadwinners? What would happen to uh, you know all those effects put together? That is what gave the government. And I, as you, uh, you said, as the president said, sometimes remaining open and uh, restricting is a choice between two rights. Because for it to remain right open, of course, business will survive. People will, uh, people will reduce suffering. But when it grows, we will protect life. But at the same time, people will suffer. Now, uh, back to the question you have, uh, you, 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 you put across that about the uh, what incentives uh, the government is putting. For the time being, uh, if you know, uh, government mainly relies on taxes collected from the private sector, and the, you are aware that the taxes and the correction have been going down because of this uh, the, the the restricted movement the business and economy is not doing well yeah but uh yeah. the hotel and uh, the that is the hospitality sector consultations are still going on to find the easiest and the best way at what interventions can be made but that is uh the, the, those are consultations which are also, which are already going on and i am certain that after consultation proper communication will be made to the sector. But for the time being, uh, I think the main uh, uh, the main concern of the government right now is to ensure the vaccination, to ensure that Kenyans are safe, to ensure uh, we remain alive. That is the, the, the main occupation of the government as we stand. And then also looking at how we shall, what measures or which interventions can be made to the sectors which have really suffered. And I agree, especially the hospitality sector, we need the, the the four zones have been yes and when you that is the five counties and when you yeah, you restrict the count the moment the five counties uh you know the contribution of those five counties the gdp is almost uh above 75 percent therefore when you close those five counties you can be sure that the effect are also felt in other uh 43 42 counties thank you okay of course, Tony, the, the, the common misconception, and I want to go back to the issue of GDP contribution from the, the, the five counties, which I believe is somewhere around 40%, but of course the ripple effects are bigger. Mm -hmm. But, but the, the common misconception sometimes is it's always about lives and livelihoods, but for some people it's actually an issue of life and death. Yeah. I think people who say it's a, it's a balance between lives and livelihoods are people who are privileged. Uh, and so you're in a position that you can say you can starve a little bit uh, from your salary or from uh, an income. Uh, but the reality is and the truth is that uh, the risk of people dying from hunger during this pandemic time is higher than people dying from COVID. Uh, and that's the truth. Uh, so like today, Kenyans, 1.4 million Kenyans are facing acute uh, starvation. Uh, that's a serious problem uh, in terms of health-wise. The fact that uh, you have these people oh, not having food, uh, and so they have an immune problem. Uh, if these people were to contract COVID, uh, 1.4 million people, I think that would be the biggest issue that Kenya will have to handle uh, because that would be a massive problem that we have. Uh, and so the, the balance between lives and livelihoods uh, is not there because uh, there are people, the lives today depend on eating, having a meal. Mm -hmm. uh, you've not had a meal for three days. Uh, and so that is the reality that Kenya needs to live. There are people in this country that are starving. Uh, and it's globally uh, because of income shocks okay. coming out of the pandemic. Uh, and so the risk, the reality is the risk of starvation leading to death is higher than the number, the risk of people dying from COVID. Okay. Uh, Magdalene, there's always uh, a feeling of the, the, a general disconnect between the, the, the government and at the policy level, of course, and businesses, small businesses, and the people. 
Yes, there's a big disconnect. Uh, for example, uh, we suffered in 2020. So in 2021, we expected a reprieve on the licenses and any other costs for running especially on in terms of the city county licenses the government licenses but we ended, ended up paying the same amount we paid in 2019 and in 2020 i think this is something that the government should have looked at because we already lost revenue in 20, in 2020 so in 2021 we should not be paying the same amounts of licenses currently if you want to operate a restaurant in the cbd you cannot run with less than 15 licenses so I'm left to wonder, why pay all this amount? Yet we suffered in 2020, and we are still suffering in 2021. Then the other thing, once the president uh, announced, he only targeted the hospitality industry. But he forgot to mention to the banks that they should give us moratorium. We, are, we have loans to pay, and the banks cannot listen right now because they don't have any directive from the government. We have to pay. Okay. We also have our equity partners. They are jittery about the investments they made earlier on. And okay. they are threatening to pull out. And of course the president has defended, uh, of course, these re re restrictions that they were announced and, and said that, you know, uh, the tax reliefs will not be country well. Let's just get that story, which is from a week after the president announced uh, the latest COVID-19 restrictions. And since the president's countrywide address on the 26th of March, the restrictions put in place to mitigate the effects of COVID-19 have been weighing on the minds of Kenyans, and for some, not for the right reasons. Closed businesses and livelihoods continue to be thorn, uh, to be thorn on the sides of many Kenyans. But as Gena Kirori now tells us, President Uru Kenyatta still stands by his decision, spelling out a longer waiting time for certain sectors. Fellow Kenyans, I know it is difficult, but we cannot pretend that this disease is not with us. President Uhuru Kenyatta stepped out to announce a new raft of measures to contain the spread of COVID-19 in the country, among them shutting down the hospitality industry and restricting movement in and out of the country's economic hub. The reactions have been swift, Kenyans accusing the government of insensitivity to the effect on households and livelihoods. Kenyatta says the decisions were informed by expert reviews and a call for safety first. They had wanted us to lock down the whole country. We had to come down to tell them we also have an economy, we also have livelihoods, which we must consider. And that is why they picked those counties that we locked down as the most heavily infected counties, and we went for what is called a partial lockdown. Bar doors were slammed shut, restaurant tables and chairs stacked, and hotels closed right before it would be a busy Easter season. Those in the hospitality sector may have to wait a little while longer before measures are put in place to help them mitigate the effect of the president's announcement last week. This, as many of those in the sector complained that their needs were not catered to in the president's announcement. The waiters and the waitresses who are working in the clubs and the bars and the hotels, where are they supposed to go? Eh? Wale managers, wale supervisors, wale mwenyewe, bouncers, DJs, musicians, wale cleaner, wale mtu anaosha cho, wale anaosha viombo, those stewards. So we have a problem in the hospitality sector, we possibly also will have a problem in the entertainment sector, and we will look to see how we can work together to support some of these uh, 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 sectors. Many had hoped for a stimulus package and perhaps further tax reliefs, more so now that there is no definite end to the containment measures. The government is, however, non-committal. It will have to be a case-by-case -case basis because this is not a national lockdown and we cannot do different tax measures you know, for one county as opposed to another. The most certain way out of the pandemic and its ravages is by flattening the curve, the head of state says. Gena Kirori, NTV. Let me just go straight to the uh, to Mr. Lawrence Karaja, the CAS, because the, the president mentioned that this um, interventions would be case by case, and he mentioned the entertainment and uh, and the restaurants and the hospitality sector and of course and i'm sure uh, mr heresy and and the lady from uh, cafe Deli are still wondering whether uh, this um, this this intervention is already in motion mr karanja 
I didn't get the last part of your question. Uh, yes, my question was, the president men mentioned that the interventions would be targeted at this um, af specifically affected sectors like hospitality and entertainment. Have these um, interventions been uh, already put in motion? Uh, the, that's what I, uh, the, the interventions, uh, which as I said, were first, the, the restrictions were on case by case. And this was where we would reduce uh, it to see, uh, this was aimed at reducing the human traffic. That is exactly what, uh, the, the, that is why we looked at it and said, fine, uh, where do we find uh, heavy human traffic, which uh, would contribute towards the spread? And we said, of course, the entertainment sectors, we said also in the religion, religious gatherings and uh, other social activities. And we said, if this, reduced then the infection rate would go down but the second phase is uh you have said fine you have done this it is going to affect that economy now the second question is what interventions are required to uh reduce the sufferings by the people who are working in those sectors i as you can see uh the question is not that uh, of about uh, life and livelihood uh, I would disagree with someone saying that it is for the privileged and the, the rest privileged. Uh, I believe uh, there is no, that when, when, when this is hit, it has no borders. It doesn't go for the privileged or the rest privileged. It is a disease of everyone. And therefore, uh, I know the issue of uh, uh, the, especially the survival and the food for some of those people who are working there is an issue. And it's an issue which is now being addressed by the Ministry of uh, River and Social Protection to see what interventions can be done, especially to support those who have not, who lost their, uh, who lost their jobs and therefore they cannot put food on their table. And it's, a, it's, it's something which is uh, the Ministry of River is on top of it. And that is why His Excellency said that whatever intervention will be taken by the time. You look at the hotel and uh, hospitality sector, you see what intervention do we require for the, for, the, for the people in business? What intervention do we require for the employees? What intervention do we require for the people who are in the supply chain? Because it has affected quite a number of people. And that, that is why I'm saying it is now two weeks since the restriction started. And I am certain that in the next few days, uh, some announcements on the interventions to be made will be, uh, will, there will be announcement of intervention. But as I said, and as I said, it will be sector targeted, knowing what it's not just a general, uh, general, general, general intervention. Okay. It will be sector specific. Okay. Mr. Mr. Hersey, of course, the, the other common misconception would be to assume that uh, this specific sectors like hospitality are the ones who will be affected only. You, I think you would agree with me that there are ripple effects. There are people who supply you, uh, let's say people from agri business who supply you with food stuff and, 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 and they will also feel the impact. The other misconception also is that, you know, this, um, and I think the pres president mentioned that counties should develop county specific um, stimulus packages. The misconception is we are assuming that only these five counties will be directly, um, you know, impacted by the restrictions. There, there, there are a couple of things here, Victor. Yeah. When we talk about uh, cessation of movement from the five counties, which includes the capital Nairobi, you'll realize that the economy in Kenya revolves a lot around Nairobi. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the nature of our setup. So if things don't work out in Nairobi, then the rest of the country is affected. And when it comes to domestic tourism and any travel, it is, all starts off from Nairobi. Even our national carrier, you know, as an airline, uh, uses Nairobi as a hub. Uh, we've tried as much as possible, and we're still trying, to try and uh, convert also Mombasa to be a good second hub. You know, we have Ethiopian Airlines, which is almost making it their own hub out here. But we're in discussions with Kenya Airways, so that, that is, also, is also done. Now, on multiplier effect, you know, Nairobi, Nakuru, Kiambu is closed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And you may say, you know what, our goods can move. But do you know that uh, we get a lot of farm produce from Kiambu to the hotels at the coast? Mm -hmm. We get a lot of farm produce from as far away in Meru. The uh, French fries that we eat come from somewhere in Kinangop. 
So all of a sudden, the farmer out there will be wondering, how comes there are no more orders coming my way? Because the hotels are empty. Occupancies dropped from a high of 90. You're supposed to accommodate, let's say, a hotel of 300 rooms, 600 guests. And within three days, you drop down to 30 guests. You tell me, how are you going to operate an operation like that one? It's extremely difficult. Okay. So while Nairobi is closed and you're saying that, well, the session of movement is not happening, the multiplier effect is big time because when all these hotels are operating, it also means that uh, fuel stations, you know, are all operating. You, you, you know, tour companies are operating. There's a lot of activities going on. But now when it comes to closure and, of course, the session of movement affects tourism big time. But specifically, let me come to eateries, and I'll speak here, uh, pick up from where Magdalene left. When we say that uh, restaurants can only do uh, takeaways, I think that is an, an extreme position because these restaurants, you'll notice that uh, they've all put in place proper social distancing. They've actually reduced their sitting capacity uh, from 190%, they're hardly operating on 30%. When you're in the CBD and you don't have an office in the CBD and you want to have a meal, where will you take your meal? Do you eat it while walking around? Mm -hmm. But again, scientifically, because we always say, you know, we want to use science to help us decide what action to take. When did we realize that restaurants, like let's say Cafe Deli, is a source of infection? It is not a source of infection. You'll have more people brushing shoulders, getting close to each other in the supermarkets. Mm -hmm. But they're all open and they're all doing business as usual. Mm -hmm. Then the same people you're saying, you know what, you can go and have a meal in a restaurant that has got sitting 30%, can go and ride in a matatu where they're all packed together. So these are some of the things that we're saying, you know what, we need to take, we support government fully. Mm -hmm. we, are not in, we are not in disagreement. But uh, some of these things can be done in a better way. Look okay. at the international travel, for instance. Yeah. We've said before coming to Kenya, you need to have a PCR negative certificate. You've done all that. You've been planning for the whole year to yeah. come to Kenya. And then you say Jomo Kenyatta International Airport is open, which is good. But the moment you land in Nairobi, you can't exit Nairobi now. You can't go to the Mara. You can't fly to wherever. Initially, we were actually allowed to do that. And quickly, of course, Kenyans, as we know, say, hey, you know what? Wait a minute. Mm -hmm. This is discrimination. But, folks, this is not discrimination. These are people who have already taken the test. They're negative. Why are you stopping them? The tour driver who is driving them is also negative. And we say, look here, mm -hmm. can we introduce the rapid test for the domestic traveler? As we speak right now, there are no flights in Nairobi to Mombasa. That yeah. should not be the case. Even for SGR, just do a rapid test. If you're negative, then you continue with whatever you are doing. And uh -huh. I think that is where we are going to balance uh, livelihoods, you know, and at the end of the day, also make sure that the health side is also tackled. But unfortunately, the way things stand, a hospitality industry always gets thrown under the bus, which is regrettable. Okay. And just before I let you go, Mr. Hersey, then the challenge with keeping flights open and SGR open and, of course, other forms of transport locked is we wouldn't be discriminating at those who don't seem um, to be financially able to afford, you know, to fly or the SGR. And once again, it drives us towards that the very same issue of a class issue and the rules that apply to some people and not other people. It is not really a class issue. All you're saying is that if you really, really want to travel, let's say you want to go to Nyeri to see your fox, you want to go to Nakuru or go to Kericho. Yeah. A rapid test. We have roadblocks. You're stopping people. At those roadblocks, you can actually have rapid tests being conducted. It's less than 1,500 shillings. All right? And if somebody really, really wants to go, they will take the quick test and they move so that you don't close everything. Because at the moment, you're closing everything. It means that nothing is moving. Yet, the other parts of the economy uh, is, is still working. I mean, the farmer will still produce, but unfortunately, hotels are not there to consume their whatever their product. Okay. And then the other thing, you know what? We are not even asking government to give us money. Mm -hmm. You know, we are saying, can we go easy? And I'm glad yesterday, the energy regulator, uh, when it comes to fuel prices, yeah. which was supposed to be in a hike yesterday, mm -hmm. but they did a sensible thing, you know, by not increasing. 
because there's only so much that the economy can take. You know, yeah. it's like a rubber band. You can't continue stretching it. Very soon, you're going to hit 130 shillings. What happens is that the moment it becomes uh, untenable, uh, economy just stops. People start stop driving. People start getting involved into business. It is okay. Let me give you the example of minimum tax. Minimum tax means you have to calculate 1% of your turnover. We're not talking about profit here. Actually, government is coming in indirectly like an owner. Even the owner doesn't collect his dividends okay. based on turnover. Mm -hmm. And it's only a country in the world, I think probably two or three only, you know? And you're doing something like that in the midst of a pandemic. Okay. You know, you cannot tax yourself out of trouble. That's the reality. Okay. And I think we need to be realistic. So the 1%, uh, you know, uh, minimum tax, we are still lobbying and saying, you know what? It really doesn't make sense. And you know what? Magdalene clearly said it. Some small businesses will say, you know what? Let me just close down. There's no point. Okay. Look at taxation. National government is doing one thing. You have got county governments on the other end. The other day, Mombasa here. I mean, they are busy chasing hotels and restaurants that did not pay uh, 2020, whatever, the licenses. And we are saying, look here, we are paying for 2021 because 2020 was virtually closed. And they're saying, you know what? We are not going to accept your 2021 until you pay 2020. And we are dealing with a myriad of taxes. Mm -hmm. You know, we say ease of doing business in this country is easy. It is not. Operating a restaurant, you need 16, 17 taxes. A hotel can go as high as 21, no taxes, 21 licenses. You go to a lobby, yeah, at the back office, we will yeah. be happy to show you 18 different licenses hanging on our walls. Okay. And surely that is not uh, any way to do business. These are some of the things that we must address as a country. And you know what? We are going through a pandemic. We are all empty. All right. So all we are saying is we are not asking any money from government. All we are saying, please, give us a little bit room to breathe so mm -hmm. that we can work and be able to pay taxes. Okay. The reality is all these empty seats that you can see. All right, a little breathe uh, to room, but a little room, of course, to breathe. But t Tony, of course, uh, even with as, as uh, Mr. Hesse speaks so passionately and, and Magdalene speaks so passionately about the things that we may have done, not done right, the question would be then, uh, you know, how could we have, um, what's, how, is there an opportunity to, that we could have taken to do things, things in a better way? Yes, yeah, definitely. I, I think what uh, Hersey is saying is, in short, is that uh, uh, the hospitality industry is bearing the biggest cost yeah. of government negligence and mishandling of the, of the pandemic. Uh, the, ideally, uh, how we expected government will be handling this, uh, we expected uh, the rapid test he's talking about that you have a full picture of what is happening mm -hmm. in the health sector. Uh, we, we've not seen that. We've seen uh, in terms of testing, uh, we're still doing a concentration of very, a very small sample. Uh, if, you big, if you do a mass uh, testing, you, you have a better picture of what you're handling. Because I differ with government when they say Nairobi is the biggest uh, infected area. Yeah. Uh, it's biggest infected area because that's the data you want to have it. Uh, because most of the tests are happening in Nairobi. That's why we're testing more. Yes. Okay. So definitely you'll have more numbers in Nairobi. It doesn't mean Nairobi leads the whole country. Uh, so unless you're doing same number of tests across the country in equal concentration, uh, then you can have such a position. Okay. But uh, let me just cut you short because in 2020 when we announced all this, um, you know, strict um, protocols, we, mm -hmm. the, the, there were some accompaniments. We saw the CBK you know, um, allowing free transfer of, of some levels of, um, some amounts of um, mobile money. Mm -hmm. We saw uh, the issue of restructuring loans. We mm -hmm. saw, uh, you know, sector-specific stimulus packages for tourism, mm -hmm. for SME. Why aren't we seeing that this time around? I think the government find itself in a difficult position that they bless themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, you have a huge budget uh, still running, even with the, during this pandemic. You have to finance it. Um, and uh, taking a, a haircut is something they cannot afford. Uh, if you look at government today, uh, they struggle paying a lot of things. Even uh, counties will tell you their equitable, equitable share of revenue. Uh, not all of it has been uh, received. Mm -hmm. Talk about CDF. And the CDF, of course. Yes, has not been received. So government finds itself in a difficult position. But the whole idea is this. Uh, when you talk about a recession, we talk about a contraction between two periods two quarters, and then it's declared a recession. Uh, and, and so a recession, if we continue to prolong these protocols, 
I think that one will be coming, definitely. Okay. But the thing is, uh, the income shock is what is bringing that contraction. And so when government tries to, 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 to bring those interventions, it's trying to address that income shock. Uh, and so this time we haven't seen that. Okay. Uh, so we expect, uh, I, one thing I differ, uh, we, let me finish this, is that uh, uh, it's the counties that are supposed to provide those interventions. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's lying to yourselves. Counties are very minimal things that they can provide in terms of interventions. It's only a licensing and all that. And the issue is not about licensing. The issue is that there is an income shock. Even if you, you waive a license, how will you sell uh, the income of that business? And I actually have that story about, uh, you know, how different counties, especially in Mount Kenya, are, are, are of course, responding to uh, the issue of COVID-19 and pro providing county-specific uh, stimulus packages. But just before that, let's actually get to listen to what some Kenyans had to say about the very same issue that we asked you in our question of the day. How have the latest COVID-19 restrictions affected you or your business? And uh, we have some a sample of sound bites from across the country on what Kenyans had to say. Kama kuna wakati tuko na shida ni wakati wa hii COVID. Kutoka president ya weke hii kavyo iliwekwa na kufunga hizi roadblocks iliwekwa, tumekuwa na shida mingi sana. Sababu kiangalia sile tauni zote kutoka embu kukuja baka hapa mwea. Tauni zote ziko kwa mbarabara tunategemea hii magari inapita kutoka meru. Kwa hivyo kama hii magari ya hiko kwa mbarabara, enye inatoka meru inaerekea na robi, ata mchere yetu ya ina customers. Sababu ya watu di wanakuja, wanasimama, wananulua vitu, vitu zetu ya pamwea. Kiangalia hata kuna watu wanafanya biyasara kama sa kupika machakula, kuna wanauza samaki kwa barabara, unakuja, unasamaki yako, unapata inaoza yote. Unauza samaki moja sababu utauzia nani. Na ule mutu wanatumei barabara ni mutu wanatoka hapa embu, anaenda makutano. Mchere yetu inunuriwi, watu nye wakua natunuria huku. Na sasa hata, kari, hata kama unaweza weka kwa gari upereke Nairobi, mafuta iko juu sana. Gari itakunja mafuta mingi na bado hizi barua za kupita zinatusumbua sana kupata. Hizo barua upati haraka na ukienda hapa pale Brupos ukipita na mchere utapita lakini kurudi watakusumbua jua una kitu. Sasa tungetaka serikali ijue ni aje sababu mwananchi wa kawaida anaumia. Tuko na meraa huku, tuko na vitugu, madizi, hakuna kitu inaweza inaenda na Nairobi juu kumefungwa. Sasa Tunauliza kama kuna kitu inaweza fanywa ili hii biashara ifuguke tuendelee juu. Eh hey, watu wengi wanalala jaa sana. Na tunagoje na school fees? Shule ziko karibu kufunguliwa. Tutatoa school fees wapi? The hospitality industry as a whole in the nation, in the whole nation uh, has been mostly affected by this pandemic. Even when the government is giving relief, uh, the tax relief and other kind of uh, benefits that people are experiencing these people are not even receiving salaries, so they even never experienced those reliefs. Uh, so the government was, uh, has been mum about these people. They, they are jobless. If they don't die of uh, the, 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 the pandemic, they are going to die of starvation. Waweze kuweka regulations zenye zita tufema sisi, kidogo tu, tuweze kujibudu sisi wenyewe na watu wenye tumeajiri na hao wengine. Dio, uh, dio, at the wrong rush, mimi nisiweze kuwa nitafunga hiyo crab. Na nikona about seven of them. I had ten. Three niliwachi za kazi. Saa hii niko seven, nikona seven of them. Nikifunga saa hii, hao wataenda nyumbani. Na hao wakienda nyumbani, watakuenda kukura nini. So president, atuagaliria masaa, ya baona hizi zingine, ya ongeze, diyo tuweza kufanya biashara. Third wave of COVID-19 has adversely affected the lives of Kenyans. Because the cost of... Uh, the cost of uh, buying goods has gone up. The fuel, fuel prices are up. And when, there is, when the fuel price is up, it comes with the multiply effect on, the, on, on ev almost all the goods and services. And the money available in the pockets of the citizens has also drastically gone down. So it, uh, it, so it has come with a lot of financial constraints at household levels and also in the, at the business front. It is very difficult for us, especially those who are running their own businesses. We don't have customers, and always people like us, we are aged. You know, it does not allow us to go out and look for business. We are just asking the government to see into it, to put rules to help us to curb the problem. Right, so of course, there's a number of Kenyans giving their views on how 
of course, that uh, the pain of the pandemic continues to hurt them and their households. And just before we, we get your feedback, of course, on regarding the sound bites of Kenyans, let's just get to that story that we promised Tony on how different counties are responding uh, to the latest restrictions. And President Uhuru Kenyatta's recent address and the decision to lock down five counties due to the spike in COVID-19 cases has faced praise and backlash in equal measure as the economy continues to suffer greatly due to the closure of businesses. The situation has been made worse by the fact that this time around, the president offered no relief. However, some county governments are now easing their burden on their residents by offering waivers and some tax relief. A few days ago, the president went on record saying it was the responsibility of county governments to cushion their residents. Harsh economic times continue to bite in the storm of the unforgiving COVID-19 pandemic. However much as the government saw it fit to lock down five counties to slow the spread of the virus, the challenge is in how to cushion the people in those five counties. President Uhuru Kenyatta says county governments should take the lead in offering relief, a complete deviation from the first wave when the government offered relief. You know, when you talk tax, you talk about the whole country. You know, you, you're not talking about a section of the country. So we, we will have to look at uh, whatever measures that we can take that can specifically apply to within uh, uh, those particular counties. This statement by President Uhuru Kenyatta has caused counties within the locked down zones and outside to employ relief measures to ease the burden on their residents in the tough times. Machakos, Nakuru and Nyeri counties were among the first to announce relief measures. In Machakos County, Governor Alfred Mutua announced that no interest and penalties on land rates for 45 days, 50% off on registration fees for public transport operators, no taxes paid in marketplaces, no payment on fees and charges on Boda Boda operators, 50% waiver on single business permits. In Nyeri County, Governor Mutai Kahiga announced different relief measures among them, 50% waivers on public service vehicles' monthly fees, 50% waiver on monthly market fees, 100% waiver of accrued penalties on houses, shops and stalls, 25% waiver on liquor license fees extended up to end of June. The county government of Nakuru offered waiver of penalties accruing after 31st of March 2021 on trade license up to 30th April. 100% waiver on land rates up to 20th April 2021. Waiver of market fees for the months of April and May 2021. Waiver of fees for Boda Boda for April. Payment of 50% monthly charges for tuk-tuk taxis for the month of April. Waiver of trade license for private schools. Apart from putting in place measures to salvage the dwindling economy, County governments have also taken steps to curb the spread of the virus. Those that are non-essential, we are suspending for one month. And the officers will work from home. So ukikuja, any, any, anybody coming to, to deal with those matters, you know, that can wait. So that we also reduce the risk to ourselves and to our people. Kiambu and Nairobi counties are considered populous among the locked down counties. However, the neighbors are yet to release official statements on how the residents will survive, forcing many in the counties to make do with the little they make. Kiambu Governor James Nyoro says the matter is being considered. We'll be looking at that, but what more important thing is to say that we as Kiambu County uh, came up with uh, uh, this uh, uh, revitalization fund, uh, the one that we, uh, we discussed with KCB. Uh, where we are averaging about 1.3 billion shillings to come to a small uh, and medium enterprise, uh, small and micro enterprises. In the last year, due to a battered economy as a result of COVID-19 and stringent measures taken by the government, the country lost 560 billion shillings in GDP, but the government announced a stimulus package to cushion Kenyans, including tax relief. Melita, Oletenges, NTV. Right.
Let me just go straight to CAS Karanja. And, and, and of course, you've had, uh, let me get your reaction to what, uh, of course, Kenyans have said regarding their pain and the call to government. And of course, the much commendable uh, interventions by government. Just briefly, sir. Uh, first, I would say this. Uh, the, there was a question and an issue here she raised, and uh, it is an issue we need to address. Yeah. Here she said that uh, uh, the supermarkets and the buses uh, are on the matatus are carrying people, mm -hmm. well as the, uh, the restaurants and other uh, entertainment joints are already closed. But it is an issue we need to look at uh, first. When people go to the supermarket, they are always wearing masks. When people are in matatus, they are always wearing masks. Mm -hmm. What about us eating restaurants and joints? Mm -hmm. They eat when they are wearing masks. That is one of the, it was, it was not just uh, something which was picked from nowhere. Yeah. It was after consultation, yeah. after looking at it, what was contributing. And for sure, if you look at uh, for the last seven days, the infection rates have been going down. There is also an issue which was raised that uh, uh, that because the tests are being done more in Nairobi, the numbers are high. Mm -hmm. I would just want to, to, to point out that the numbers might be high, but we don't just look at the numbers that Nairobi has 200. Mm -hmm. We look at the percentage, the rate of infection, such that if we test 30 people in Lamu, we'll subject it to a percentage and see how many have tested positive. Therefore, the rates the, in terms of percentage in the five counties was alarmingly high, and that is why a decision uh, was made. Fair point, I agree yes. on the issue. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's fair point. Let's just go yes. to the, the point I was asking you then. Uh, what was that? Sorry? Your, it was your, to just get your reaction to the comments and what the counties are doing, of course, to respond uh, on their own. That is where I was going now to the counties. And yeah. I'm going to, the, to what the counties are doing. And I said, you know, our trade is devoted to function. And therefore, each county has a way and means of dealing with the traders who are operating within the counties. And as we said, you can see what uh, Nakuru and Machakos have done, which is extremely commendable because it has eased the burden on the traders and the business people who have been affected. Uh, as a national government, and, and I say, when it comes to issue of the licenses, it is the county government. Uh, the, the, the few, uh, the few uh, licenses issued by agencies of the national government to the restaurants, and especially to the major hotels, those are that done to ensure that our hotels comply with the international standards and international requirements. Therefore, that's why some of those inspections are done, okay. and the license or certification okay. issued. Therefore, the issue of uh, the county governments, we say that because trade is devolved, that's why we say it. Can each county look at the businesses operating within the counties and come up with specific intervention which will assist the traders operating within those county governments? Okay. And of course, true to your word, a number of counties have responded and are indeed developing county specific stimulus package. The question then would be is it enough? Will that be able to, of course, keep businesses and households going uh, for the period as we wait for the COVID numbers to come down? But we have to go for a quick break at this moment. Don't go anywhere because when we come back from this short break, we talk about the impact, of course, of these restrictions and how we can move forward. Vaseline Skin Care. Vaseline has a triple purified formula that creates a layer that locks in moisture, which allows your skin to heal from within.
Vaseline applied before you sleep can help restore your face's natural level of moisture and softness. To keep skin restored, that's the healing power of Vaseline. Maritime Tips, brought to you by Kenya Maritime Authority. Preserve our marine environment. Oceans are our source of food, employment, recreation, fishing, shipping, and tourism. Therefore, properly dispose litter on waste bins during beach excursions. Do not throw plastic litter or pour oil into marine waters. Cut down on plastic use. Do not endanger marine life. Influence change near you. Share what you know with your friends and family. Report any accident or incident to the Regional Maritime Rescue Coordination Center, Kenya Maritime Authority, for safe and efficient water transport. In case of any oil spill emergencies at sea, call the Regional Maritime Rescue Coordination Center on 0721-368-313 or 0737-719-414 or you can visit us on www.kma.go.ke or Facebook Kenya Maritime Authority, Twitter at KMA Kenya or YouTube Kenya Maritime Authority. Did You Know segment brought to you by EACC in partnership with the International Development Law Organization, IDLO. Leadership comes with responsibilities. It brings honor to the nation and dignity to the office, demonstrates respect for the people, is responsibility to serve the people. The only way the nation moves united to go far. Report all forms of corruption and unethical conduct to the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Committee. Wow, thank you for your time. Mm. How juicy. Juicy. Juicy food, juicy, juicy food. You thanks. That's an easy bucket. There it takes six plus a game. Donovan in the paint. That one won't go, but there's a big bucket. Alfia by seven right now. Early second quarter. Nice pass by Luka Doncic to Powell. For Come on, Donovan. Oh, oh, no, he didn't. Yes, he did. Oh, that's. Beat up top to Christian Wood, who hammers it down. Fouled in a process. Contender in the West. They come in at four, as that is denied at the rim. McGee. Stop. I mean, he's making from everywhere. Now he has two right there. So not looking to score. Alley oh, oh, what a pass and finish. Uh oh. Uh -oh. oh watch out. Look out. Three on two if they hurry. Grayson Allen lobs it for Moran, who hammers it down. Pretty play. Try Panadol Advance for relief from headaches, body aches, and fever. With Panadol's Optizob formula, the tablet gently breaks down in the stomach, quickly absorbs, and starts providing pain relief in 15 minutes. For fast and effective pain relief that you can trust, try Panadol Advance. We are talking about the COVID-19 impact on the Kenyan economy. Of course, thank you for staying with us. I have Tony Watima, an economist with me in studio. Mohamed Hersi, the chairman of the Kenya Tourism Federation, is joining us live from Mombasa. Magdalene Moiruri, the general manager of Cafe Delhi, is with me in studio as well. And, of course, Laris Karanja, the chief administrative secretary in the Ministry of Industrialization and Trade, is also joining us virtually from his office. And earlier on, we asked you to be part of this conversation, by the way. And on our question of the day, we asked you how has the latest COVID-19 restrictions affected you or your business? And some of you have been responding, by the way. We have Mark. He says, our pockets are drying at an increasing rate, yet more taxes are added to fuel, skyrocketing the prices of basic needs. Thank you, Mark. 
we have who? Mutio. He says, as a young entrepreneur, I did set up a small club in Kasarani late 2019. From March 2020 to date, the business has been on and off because of the new MOH guidelines and local police interference with rent to pay and salaries. We have officially closed the business and sent our employees home. Thank you, Mutio. Of course, uh, we... Uh, Matthews Ondori says, it has affected me so much and it, as in my job requires a lot of movements from counties. The government needs to bail, out, uh, to bail us out as we are at a bigger loss. All right, Frank, he says, though, though everything is in a mess, I'm just thankful for every moment. Thank you very much, Frank. Yes, of course, that's, we could, uh, that's what we could sample for you at the moment. Let me just go straight to Magdalene. Magdalene, I'm sure you, 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 you resonate with most of the comments that have been uh, sent out by our viewers. Yes, that's for sure. One of the things that has really caught my eye is how uh, employees are suffering. Because one of the things that we expect them to do is to perform, right? But now they are all at home. They have bills to pay. They have school fees to pay. They have rent to pay. At the moment, they are not able to. And this goes back to, let me take you back to 2020. Once we were allowed to open for dine-in, yeah. after the first two months of the lockdown, yeah. what happened was, uh, any time an employee loses his job, it affects them mentally. So the job performance cannot be the same uh -huh. as how it was in 2019. Interesting. So we lose a lot of productivity in that regard. So at the end of the day, it's the employees who are suffering the most. At okay. the moment, all staff at Cafe Daily are really, really stressed up. And they are wondering what will happen at the end of this month, what will happen next month. Mm -hmm. It's been almost three weeks, and the government, government has not said anything about it. Okay. And I'm sure, of course, you're putting in place several measures to make sure that you don't necessarily fire people if they can work on shifts and all that, so that, of course, we can all uh, continue sustaining ourselves. But uh, the other question would be then, for how long can the business take it? It cannot sustain, because at Cafe Daily we have 100 staff. At the moment, I had mentioned that we are only working with 15% of that number, and they are all working in shifts and on a casual basis. It's not sustainable at all. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let me just go to Mr. Hersey at this point. Mr. Hersey, uh, I mean, to, the tourism sector is definitely um, a very important cog in our economy, a key contributor to our GDP. But earlier on, you mentioned that there is a limit at which we can, we can no longer stretch this. You know, for any business and uh, for any setup, the, if you push the rubber band uh, too much, it will snap. So we need to be careful and uh, we need to balance anything that we do. Uh, I think I'll pick up from where Magdalene Lara left. The yeah. issue of staff, we all talk about businesses, but uh, we don't talk about the staff. Let me tell you the serious mental issues right now. Uh, employees, not just only in tourism, but in many industries, people who used to take care of themselves suddenly, and I'm sure you must have noticed that, Victor, even yourself, yeah. that we're getting texts from people who never used to ask for money. Yeah. People who were able to, you know, they, 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 they used to work a lot with, you know, they take care of themselves, they take care of the families. Mm -hmm. But suddenly they are asking for very small amounts and say, you know what, please get me something to tide me over so that I can face the next week. That is the reality. And uh, we feel for the staff, forget about small restaurants. Uh, I'll talk even about large hotels. Even in 2020, forget about 2021. Yeah. A lot of the staff were actually sent away on half pay, mm -hmm. eventually went to uh, some stipend, uh, something like 10,000, 15,000, big change, you know. But even those ones, I'll say, you know what, we can no longer afford this. So guys have been sent away now totally on unpaid leave altogether. And for, for me, I think that is a serious, you know, sticking form that we really need to deal with. Okay. We cannot just assume that all will be well and we say, you know what, uh, it's okay. They'll be able to take care of themselves. Again, I repeat, and I've had uh, 
Mr. Mingo, you know, the Cabinet uh, Assistant Secretary saying that uh, people wear masks in supermarkets, people wear masks in the other, even hotels. Mm -hmm. People wear masks. They only remove them when, when they, they are have having their meal. Mm -hmm. And as long as you're not showing signs, you know, you're sneezing, you're coughing, you tell me, mm -hmm. the political rallies, who was wearing taxis, who was wearing masks? Mm -hmm. That's where we had the biggest problem. Okay. And I'm glad two days ago, leading politicians came out and said, you know what? We caught this virus from these rallies. And mm -hmm. I pray and I hope rallies will not come anytime soon because that's where our problems began. We okay. did so well the whole of good part of last year. Then January, February, we behaved like, you know, COVID was made to exit this country and there's no more COVID. Okay. And here we are today. But as things are, we need now to, you know, cool down and do sensible moves. For instance, international travel, we need to allow it. Our country today needs all the foreign exchange we can bring in. Mm -hmm. Why are we denying ourselves that person who can bring the dollars, somebody who can bring us all the euros, and they've been tested, they're negative. Why are we denying ourselves? Our shilling is suffering. It's trading at what? 110 shillings. It should be sitting somewhere 98 or 99. So those are low-hanging apples that we can actually harvest and do it comfortably. So okay. all is not lost. Okay. And maybe for Magdalene, of course, the biggest challenge for you has been uh, with the curfew, especially, is the reduced number of business hours. Because if you're closing, if the curfew time is at 8 p.m., it probably means you the, the, the latest you can still open the business is 7 p.m. And probably the latest you can still admit people is maybe 6 p.m. Um, and, and for now, I think it's official. It's been confirmed that uh, the curfew hours will be in place for, I think, uh, until the end of uh, May, which is basically a new month of June. Okay. Um, now, at the moment, because they are doing takeaway, yeah. it hasn't affected as much as it had affected mm -hmm. when we had dine-in. Mm -hmm. Because what time do restaurants make money? Between 4 p.m. until late hours. Mm -hmm. Because people are leaving their jobs to come and have a cup of tea, a cocktail, a meal. But right now, because of uh, the um, reduce, reduction of the curfew, what happens is by 4 p.m., people are already going home. And who is going to buy a takeaway on and their way And go into home? a matatu. Exactly. <laughs> It doesn't I get it. make sense. Yeah. I understand. Of course, I resonate. And, 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 and back to you, Tony. I, I, this is the year, and I, I, I like to mention this, that uh, from my opinion and for most uh, people, they expected that this is the year that we will start to see things looking up. In fact, the IMF in themselves projected a 7.6% growth for Kenya. Treasury said 6.4%. <laughs> okay. Uh, le let me start by saying something, uh, correct something that uh, yeah. I said here before and then the CS responded about testing. Yeah. I think his uh, presumption is that when you do a percentage of uh, counties, uh, yeah. uh, unless you're doing, a, let me, a statistics class here will be that uh, uh, you're doing a random, random distribution of, of testing. Mm -hmm. That's not what we're doing. The point is uh, our testing capacity is uh, biased mm -hmm. in Nairobi, concentrated, mm -hmm. concentrated largely in Nairobi. Uh, what he's saying will make sense if we are doing a random distribution of sampling, then you'll have to do a percentage of every county according to population. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that one will give a better picture. But since we're not doing that, mm -hmm. I think the, the, the point is that our testing capacity is in Nairobi. So we have that bias when you're doing a, an inference from that sample. And so coming back to your question, uh, you're, you're asking about... Uh, the 7.6% and the rosy picture of 6.4% growth in 2020. I, I think uh, IMF and Treasury, uh, uh, they have a bias, mm -hmm. about an optimistic bias when they do their modeling about growth. Uh, we don't see that happening, mm -hmm. uh, and that's the reality. Uh, I think the, 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 the modeling was done uh, before the restrictions and all that were placed, mm -hmm. um, and, and that will make sense. Uh, but still the figure will be too high, mm -hmm. uh, because even before we are doing around 6% growth, and much of that was public investments. Uh, government has reduced its investments. Productivity in private sector has gone down. Uh, so we don't expect to be at the levels of where we were pre-COVID. Okay. Uh, uh, but uh, we, that, that, that is an optimistic bias in modeling. And, okay. uh, and I think we, we, we'll get to reality when it happens. And I actually have a caller. His name is Bor from Bomet. But just before I take that caller, I think he's waiting for us. Then uh, th Can we afford the, the kind of job losses that we saw in 2020 briefly, Tony? Uh, no, no, no. We cannot afford. And, and the tragedy is that, and that's the problem that we have in our economy. The moment you have an, in, an income shock and then business are able to drop people out yeah. and, and job losses, uh, getting the economy back 
basically is about getting people back to work mm -hmm. will take time because capital investment that will be needed and all that uh, quite a number of business might go under and not survive yeah uh, and that's the point about interventions by government and relays okay. so that you're able to keep uh, business afloat mm -hmm. during this period of time and mm -hmm. so when the recovery a stable recovery starts happening mm -hmm. you're able to absorb a big number and recover better but the fact that at this point in time if we continue with these uh, guidelines that we have uh, i think the problem without interventions is that we will struggle getting people back to jobs again okay Let's just talk to Bor from Bomet here. He's, uh, he's calling in from Bomet. Bor, if you can hear me, uh, please uh, shoot your question or comment. Yes. Asante. Uh, I used to be a transporter of timbers to Nairobi. Yeah. And we are facing very many problems. Yeah. Especially when we are going to, to those markets, you are selling timbers for three weeks, and yet uh, 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 before the COVID started, mm -hmm. we were selling very quickly. Okay. So, uh, this year, if we are not so uh, vigilant, yeah. uh, we have to, as the disease is going on, yeah. we are facing problems in Bormet. Okay. I am living in a rural area whereby we are, we are on such things that, that we are not to not take care of uh, we are Business. Okay. Asante. So, uh -huh. As part of what you have said, yeah. if we are not serious over the disease, we have, we have to follow the, the, the step ups. Okay. And then we will be safe. Okay. Asante you know, the start with now yeah. uh, is, is going to disturb everything. We are not to be serious. Okay. Yes. And of course, speaking about seriousness, we have the Chief Administrative Secretary, Mr. Lawrence Karanja. Uh, he will be responding to the issue of seriousness. But Mr. Karanja, the, the, the other secret to um, our response and our resilience in 2020, other than the stimulus packages, of course, was that many households and businesses actually had some, some bit of savings, some bit of money somewhere that you can use to keep yourself moving. From the way Magdalene is speaking, of course, many of them don't have that now. And at the same time, uh, most of the stimulus packages that we saw last time are not coming through. Maybe from where you sit, how should um, any household, uh, an employer, an individual or a business keep moving forward as we, of course, look forward to the easing of these restrictions? Thank you. I agree with uh, both, uh, in fact, uh, with Elsie and uh, Magdalene yeah. about uh, the loss of jobs. I agree with you that uh, in 2020, okay. some of the employees might have had some savings, which they were lying on. Yeah. And, uh, but you know, we had just eased the restrictions. A number of them had just gone back to their places of work, and then the restrictions are back. It's not an easy thing for, for, for it's not an easy thing for, for the employees. And uh, that's what I said. The government. Uh, understand the pressure, especially uh, those employees working in the restaurants and uh, they are going through what they are going through. And uh, I don't think there is a, a straight formula which we can say that this is a, what they are supposed to do for them to survive, because mm -hmm. if they don't have money, that is the truth, they have no money. Mm -hmm. And uh, mind what we are saying is that the government is to try to look at the intervention we can come to support, especially those people who have lost. And uh, I am, as I said, the Ministry of River and Social Protection is working day and night to come up with the data and uh, to develop what interventions they will have to support the people who have lost their job, especially those who are now working in those uh, in, in those in, in those sectors. Again, I also agree with Margaret uh, Magdalene when she says that uh, when you have lost your job, you have been out, then you are called back. Yeah, psychologically, you are not okay. Therefore, even the productivity rate uh, goes down. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the, this is, is a big challenge to us in the way we do business. The, uh, remember what uh, some of the, but some, especially for the for the eateries, there are some which uh, have responded with the e-commerce, and people are doing this and are getting surprised. But uh, it's not easy because some people would want to sit in the restaurant, in the restaurant not just to eat. But to transact business, that is the biggest loss they have suffered. But for those who wanted to to eat, I think now uh, e-commerce is the way to go 
but uh, I, for the, on the part of the government, our we are seriously looking at how to support the employees who have lost their job uh, because of the recent measures. And I, I just, at the risk of repeating myself, I just say, say that the Ministry of Labor and Social Protection is on top of it. Okay. And and just maybe before I let you go, in, in 2020, there were this um, sector-specific stimulus packages. There was one targeted at tourism. There was one for SMEs. There was even this SME credit guarantee scheme. Are these, uh, you know, packages and, and interventions still there? Uh, I would say, for instance, uh, what was the fund, which was uh, the fund for the tourism, is still being absorbed. Mm -hmm. uh, the credit guarantee scheme is still going on. We have already qualified several banks, which are supposed to uh, operationalize it. And uh, so the credit guarantee scheme for the SMEs is still there. Uh, the fund for the tourism is still there because they have not even been exhausted. In fact, I would say this, uh, for, for instance, for this SME, the credit guarantee scheme are not being operationalized. This is the time it's being operationalized. Therefore, as soon as uh, the, it is operationalized, the entire fund will be there. And the fund, you remember, was part of it was coming from the government, and there, another huge part was coming from the private sector through the banks, uh, the commercial banks, which were prepared to offer the credit guarantee scheme. Therefore, those interventions which were announced last year, quite a number of them, are still available, and uh, it's, it's not only really that it has not been announced, but the process and was not. In fact, for as I've said, for SME, had not been operationalized. This is the time now we are at the tail end, and we'll be releasing it to all SMEs for the uptake. So that would be something for the for the SMEs. And okay. uh, as we had said, what, what the, the credit guarantee scheme will be a scheme which will be open to the SMEs to enable them assess funding from the commercial banks at low rate. That's number one. Number two, with less stringent measures, where we, if you, because some of them, if they are evaluated because of the performance arising from COVID-19, they may not qualify for the credit or for, for normal credit. Okay. Therefore, for the bank, if the government will be coming and say, give this person this credit, even if he doesn't qualify, if he defaults, the government becomes the guarantor. So the scheme will still be available. Thank okay. You. Two questions, Bananaibo Waziri, because there's also, I mean, if this uh, stimulus packages were from 2020 and, you know, they, are no, they have not been utilized at, uh, up to this point in an economy that is struggling that, uh, that like ours, the question would be then why, w w what is behind the very low uptake of this, you know, um, you know well-intentional, um, you know, uh, interventions and then number two the issue of the SME guarantee scheme you, you're, you're talking about how it's going to be operationalized soon this was still part of our response in 2020 I'm sure even Tony would be itching to ask why it's taken so long uh, to operationalize something that was supposed to bail us out a year ago uh, thank you first uh, if you remember the credit guarantee scheme uh, when it was announced sometimes in June last year, yeah. uh, it had to go through a process. First, we had to come with a registration or regulations through parliament, and that was done. After that was done, then we had to requalify the bonds which were to offer these services. It took some time. And uh, also, when the bonds were requalified, there had to be negotiations which will be the terms and the conditions, which will be the contribution of the banks, which will be the contribution, what will be the contribution of the banks, what will be the contribution of the government, and how the, 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 the system will operate. And this took uh, quite some time. And as and thereafter, the, 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 the process is needed for the uptake. What sometimes, uh, and uh, this is something as soon as uh, it's ready, we'll do is we have to go out to and uh, carry out campaign and sensitize Okay. The the SMEs the fund is available. So that, but what I would say is that there had to be there. You know, this is something which just came. There were no system. There were no laws. There are no regulations. And there is no way we could just have said, "Here is a money. Here is a credit guarantee. SMEs go for it." It had to be in a structured way. That is what took time. Okay. All right. And I think, of yeah. course, we have another caller. Let me just get his name. Yes. Um, we have a caller online. If you can ask your question, that is Johnny. If you can ask your question or comment, please shoot it. 
that is John from Meru. Unfortunately, we have uh, lost John uh, from Meru. But l let me just come back to you before we take this break, um, Tony, then, uh, because 560 billion is the amount of um, the estimated amount uh, that we lost to COVID-19 in 20, uh, 2020. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about 2021 almost looking like another lost year. Can we afford another lost year? Uh, I, I think uh, the reality is that we'll have to afford it, whether we like it or not. Mm -hmm. uh, the reality is that um, we're still fighting the pandemic uh, and we still have some mishaps about that fight. And so the cost is huge on us uh, and we'll have to take that cost. I, I think one of the main things that we, we need to see is the uh, government has, 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 has published a recovery plan, which is not quite convincing. Mm -hmm. uh, because a stable recovery plan during this pandemic is fundamentally upon a mass vaccination uh, exercise, a universal one. Uh, we don't see that, uh, and that's the reality. So even if we talk about a credit guarantee scheme, a credit guarantee scheme, and I agree with the CS, it takes time to set it up, uh, to have a, 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 a one that is working. Uh, it takes a lot of time because it has a lot of bureaucracy, and you need to put some tight controls out of it. But it will become timely if that credit guarantee scheme comes in the stable, the stable recovery that we are doing completely out of the pandemic that people are able to access credit and build their businesses, and there will be no shutting down again. I think that would be the way, best way forward. The fact that we don't have a government, that uh, we government doesn't have a proper structural uh, recovery plan mm -hmm. that we say from today, we are targeting 30% vaccination, 40%, 60%, then we start opening up sectors, and people are able to access uh, those capital and uh, credit guarantee scheme and all that. Uh, w we will continue having the same problem. Maybe if we guarantee people today, okay. in the next six months, if a fourth wave is coming, they'll have to shut down again. And that's another problem. We'll have to bail out again mm -hmm. when you're opening up. Okay. So th that recurrence will not be helping us. We need a stable recovery plan going forward. Okay. Wonderful, of course, a very interesting conversation ongoing here in the studio about how COVID-19 continues to impact our economy. We have to go for a quick break. But on the other end of this break, we talk about the way forward. Can we actually... Um, you know, reduce the number of infections without this disruptive um, kind of interventions. Also, can we avoid um, having another 2020 in 2021? Right after this break. As we enter another chapter of the COVID-19 pandemic, rest assured that we aim to deliver the same level of professionalism, excellence and integrity you have come to expect from us. We did it once before and now we are better prepared and equipped to ensure that our future leaders get what they truly deserve, the best education. Applications can be done online via ztech.ac.ke. To achieve great things in life, you must do little things every day like the one, two, three with Colgate. with Colgate and give yourself a future to smell about. Just one capful of Dettol is enough to disinfect surfaces and protect your family and your home. Dettol, tested effective against COVID-19. Legislative reforms are necessary to strengthen the Leadership and Integrity Act 
in order to realize Chapter 6 of the Constitution. The law requires all avenues of appeal to be exhausted before removal from office. Do we accept that to be the only way? Join us this Thursday at 7.30 p.m. as we answer this question on leadership and integrity on the Nation Leadership Forum. Nation Leadership Forum. Engaging society, impacting the nation. Fact Finder from the BBC. Be wary, not everything you come across on the internet about cancer is true. We look at the myths and misconceptions. And how much of a cancer risk is processed meat? We hear from health experts. Beat sensitivity pain fast with Sensodyne Rapid Action. For clinically proven relief in 60 seconds. Try Panadol Advance for relief from headaches, body aches, and fever. With Panadol's Optizob formula, the tablet gently breaks down in the stomach, quickly absorbs, and starts providing pain relief in 15 minutes. For fast and effective pain relief that you can trust, try Panadol Advance. Very beautiful pictures of Ngong Hills. They have such a picturesque place. Uh, if you need to go out this weekend, you should consider it. You're watching your world this morning. We are talking about COVID-19 and how it has affected the economy. But before we go back to close that conversation we've been having, let's just give you a small update from across the world now. And French pharmacies have begun stocking COVID-19 self-tests, which are supposedly easier to use as they do not require the intervention of a health professional. The new tests are st still involve a nasal swab, but are quicker and less unpleasant than the ones carried out by healthcare staff and will allow people to easily test themselves for COVID-19 at home. They are, however, less effective in detecting the virus than the traditional antigenic and PCR tests. Oui, alors, so, donc, c'est un autotest. Donc, oui. And aware of the dangers of pollution harming the planet and human beings, young volunteers from four citizen mobilization campaigns in Cyprus are innovating to raise awareness on environmental issues by organizing cleanup campaigns and launching waste management initiatives. The Save the Your Hood campaign started in Greece and was launched in Cyprus in 2021 by Giannis Pepitsisos and residents of Limassol who shared a goal and vision to inspire all citizens to clean up their neighborhoods. The group organizes cleaning campaigns on its Facebook page every weekend. <laughs> Yes, and some of you have been talking to us, by the way, on that question that we asked you how uh, the latest COVID-19 restrictions has affected you or your business. Let's get to see some of that. And Shem Bernard, he says, I lost my job. Every place I go, I'm being told there's no job, even in Django. I, I have to pay my bills, but how? I wish I can go back to my village. But how? The roadblocks are awaiting. Of course, we uh, see your frustration, Mr. Sham. Roxel Ndogo says, no jobs, more debts loading. Thank you, Roxel. We have some more. Yes, Gibson Ngetichi says, no food, no rent. Clearly, of course, a number of Kenyans are giving their frustrations. And we have a caller from Meru. I believe that should be John. John, if you can hear us, please um, shoot your comment or question. 
Thank you very much. I can hear you very clearly. Yes. But then what I'm asking myself as yeah. a citizen and someone someone from Meru. Yeah. We are really worried about the economy. Mm -hmm. Yes. But then mm -hmm. the most surprising thing is is about the corruption which has been done with the Kemsha while doing this uh, COVID. Mm -hmm. What is the government doing? In fact, what should be yelling is that is that from the CID bosses or is a criminal or working at Tobiko, explaining to the citizens what is happening with, with, our, with this money for Kemsha. Because your person is made to affect his son economically. Mm -hmm. Because you cannot be given money as citizens and then mtumoja anaweka kwa mfuko. Kama hii pesa ya COVID, meru likuliwa yote na la governor. Na in fact, hakuna pesa watu wapipata. So, we okay. ask, why should we have such a, a conferences to explain Kenyans? What is happening with these people? Okay. Yes. Thank you very much, John from Meru, of course, uh, giving his own uh, personal views regarding how, of course, the country is uh, utilizing the COVID-19 funds. And I think uh, we didn't mention this, Tony, but of course, the issue of how the funds that have been collected from both the private sector and from donors and, 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 and other partners are being utilized is adding to the collective anger and frustration mm -hmm. uh, in Kenyans. I think that's a good point, and uh, that's what I, one of the main things I talk about: government mishandling of the of the pandemic. Uh, if what we budgeted for and what was supposed to be done by Kemsa uh, and was done as expected, I think we will have uh, less issues to deal with. And uh, if we put such measures that uh, the imports that we are doing about fighting the pandemic and all that. People like uh, guys in the he uh, hospitality sector will mm -hmm. not be taking the heavy brunt they are taking today. Yeah. And that's the cost of corruption. The fact that it's we citizens who take that cost up in terms of ge not government negligence, of government ineptitude, being mm -hmm. able to, to react to the problems that we are facing. So the cost is huge, and it's a good thing that you raised that. That's not a conversation we're having. We're having this conversation isolated, uh, and we don't connect the two. Uh, the cost of corruption is heavily on the citizen because they are the people who are denied services out of that corruption. Mm -hmm. And that we've seen it very clearly in this period of time, that we're taking a heavier cost of government's corrupt, uh, network of corruption. Uh, and so even the lives that we've lost, mm -hmm. we will have protected more lives if we had such measures were doing proper uh, procurement process and delivery of services to the general Kenyan. Okay. And of course, uh, I think the general feeling just before we went, we went to the break was this pandemic might be here to stay. Uh, we might not be, uh, we might not see 2021 as we mm -hmm. thought it would be. Yeah. Uh, so then how do we move on from here? There, the cost of living is high, mm -hmm. Tony. Mm -hmm. The cost of fuel is so high, the government had to intervene yesterday and stabilize it, despite the fact that the landed cost went up by, I think, up to four shillings per liter. Yeah. And, 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 and more people are losing jobs. More are likely to even lose their jobs in the coming days. Yes. The numbers of COVID-19 are still up there. The mm -hmm. third wave is, has come with a lot of vengeance. Mm -hmm. The question everyone is asking themselves, and I'm sure even government are asking themselves, is how do we move forward um, from this point with all these uh, variables? I, I think we, we, we are faced in a situation called a trilemma. Mm -hmm. uh, we a have trilemma. A trilemma. Wow, yeah, why, three. Am I, why am I hearing this for the first time? Uh, a dilemma. <laughs> so the dilemma is a two option. Okay. It's a trilemma. Mm -hmm. uh, first, uh, we, we have a government that uh, is caught up in an economic problem outside the pandemic. Yeah. Uh, we've done a lot of uh, infrastructure projects. You have to pay a lot of debts out of that. Government is, lack, is lacking revenue out of that. And so we've seen government shrinking uh, in contraction in terms of that. Apart from that, we have now a pandemic that is coming. Uh, and the pandemic is coming, uh, the economic disruption within the pandemic is losing jobs. And so if you're talking about a recovery, we'll be talking a recovery from a position of vaccination. Mm -hmm. And there is no other way. Uh, if you look at government program about uh, vaccination program, they talk about vaccinating 30% of the population in 2023. Yeah. Uh, we are talking about a recovery uh, around- in 2024. Yes, or 2025, mm -hmm. uh, because we, had, we at least need to get at 60% herd immunity mm -hmm. in terms of getting out of the pandemic completely. Uh, so so that the, the problem is that unless we have government prioritizing vaccination, that is a starting point about the recovery, uh, we will never get out of this problem. The pandemic is here for another 10 to 15 years. 
Uh, but it depends on how government reacts to that uh, and uh, a herd immunity process that you're try, trying to build. So if you create a herd immunity from vaccination, you're able now to handle the economic impact. But apart from that, even if you're handling an economic impact from uh, income shocks and uh, job losses and all that, uh, uh, we also have a government that is unsustainable in terms of debt, su debt sustainability, in terms of uh, revenue collection, in terms of all that. Mm -hmm. Government itself and on the economy side has its own problem. That's the trilemma that I'm talking about, those three problems that we have. But uh, the priority now, we don't see that government has prioritized max vaccination, which is the main thing that we talk about, a recovery. And so the whole of this year, we expect that uh, we'll still be in this problem of uh, shutting down and opening up, shutting down and opening up. Uh, and we don't see us getting out of this point in time anytime soon. So unless we have a priority that government tries to prioritize mass vaccination, mm -hmm. we will always remain in this problem. Okay. With a third wave, the fourth wave, and the fifth wave coming mm -hmm. uh, till the day we get a herd immunity. Yes. Okay. Mr. Hersi, do you think uh, this issue about vaccination would help with regards to the tourism sector? <coughs> the, you asked for what is the way forward, yeah. and vaccination is certainly a major, major uh, way forward for us. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would like to thank government because uh, a couple of, actually it's yesterday, we got word that now they have accepted officially to include uh, tourism players and specifically hospitality industry, which is, you know, the frontliners, uh, that will be hotel workers, restaurant workers, uh, tour operators. Uh, and they've given us 50,000 uh, vac uh, vaccines mm -hmm. that will be rolled out for the hospitality industry. And one of the things we want to do is to get, you know, something like our national carrier, Kenya Airways, uh, vaccinating the entire crew, uh, mm -hmm. all these airlines that handle international tourists equally do the same, and all our hotels as well, so that people feel safe when they come here. Because right now, that is becoming a unique selling proposition in many countries. Uh, next door, Rwanda, I've already done that with the national carrier, although smaller. And they're saying, you know what, like the Maldive Island, they're saying, you come here, everybody that you're going to meet, they're creating a sort of a bubble uh, that you do not stand any chance of getting uh, infected because all these guys have been vaccinated. So yes, vaccination is the way to go. And I'll urge all Kenyans uh, to, you know, to take the vaccine when you get the opportunity. That's very, very important. And uh, we fully support that. And hopefully once that happens, then we can go back to the source market, including our own domestic market. Yeah. That you know what, when you mm -hmm. come to a hotel, it does not mean that you're 100% safe, but the degree that you can, uh, you know, uh, uh, infect someone drastically is reduced, or even for you uh, to get seriously sick. So even the vaccine is still not uh, a white, uh, I mean, a blank check uh, yeah. to make people to go out and misbehave, but obviously it reduces, you know, the risk. So vaccine, yes, is the way to go. And we are also at advanced state when it comes to the health passport uh, in conjunction with government and also the IATA and all our members and the international partners, how we can do this. Then we've also launched an app called Mtali, which is open to everybody. You can download it. You can download it on both iPhone and uh, also any Android. Yeah. And uh, you'll clearly see what tourism industry players are doing and is also keeping live uh, you know, real-time data in terms of Kenya and the infection rate, uh, fatalities and many others. But apart from that, we've also come up with different departments. We've got tours, we've got hotels, we've got restaurants, everything that we are able to, we are doing. And then staff who have enrolled in that program are also able to sit a quick exam and the way they succeed, they actually get a certificate uh, on the spot. So all this is our effort to make sure that and to convince any traveler, whether locally or globally, that yeah. Kenya is a serious destination. And we, you know, we've put our ducks in a row and we're getting ready. It doesn't mean that uh, we are saying there's no COVID. We support government, but all we want is we need to be practical in the approaches that we make. Thank you. Okay. And just before, before you go, then give me your outlook for 2021, especially for the tourism sector, with, of course, this issue of the vaccine in the horizon. Of course, it was looking really good, let me tell you, before this latest cessation of movement. Yeah. Uh, the U.S. market, which is the international market, when you look at uh, international travelers, we look also at the yield, at the average spend per client. The U.S. market is the, one of the highest, North America, which is also includes Canada, 
which is one of the highest. And then, of course, you've got other countries which will give you less than half of what the U.S. will give you. Yeah. And Joe Biden, the new president of the U.S., has promised by, by June this year, they will have vaccinated close to 300 million Americans. We attracted just about 300, 400,000 Americans in our best year. So it is not difficult, you know, to bring some half a million Americans. Mm -hmm. And they're willing. And we're getting all this booking coming in. Yeah. But obviously now this has just... Uh, made them get worried mm -hmm. because they really don't know you know they're saying you know what even for my july safari circuit i'm not very sure that you guys will wake up again and do another cessation of movement mm -hmm. i just hope it doesn't happen but we can salvage uh july august september yeah. and with support of our kenya tourism board they're given enough funding because another thing is that when it comes to budget cuts we're very quick to cut budgets for kenya tourism board yeah uh which is already uh, when you look at the fund they've been given, it's so small, you know, compared to other countries, the amount that they have to market their destination. Yeah. So we need to support KTB strongly so that we can go to the source markets, whether it's North American market and the European market. These people are already vaccinated and ready to travel. Let them come to Kenya. Okay. And that's what we would like uh, to see happening. To answer your question, yes, we can salvage something. Yeah. But for us to go back to 2000, 2019, yeah. I'm sorry, that will not happen anytime soon. Okay, wonderful. And, and of course, we have to close this conversation, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And I'll start with you, Magdalene. What is the way forward from the point of a restaurant that has already, is already operating with only 15% of, of their total employees and they don't want to s fire more people? They don't see um, the business being sustainable, perhaps beyond two or three or four months. Um, what is the way forward from uh, where you sit? Okay. Um, first of all, uh, when uh, the lockdown was announced, we had just finished renovating our third branch after a fire incident in la which happened last year, July. Yeah. So we, we brought on board our staff who were very happy at that point because they realized that things were going back to normal. But barely a week after we opened, we were shut down. So now, what I'm saying is, we are not looking for money from the government. Mm -hmm. We are looking for a conducive climate mm -hmm. to trade. And one of the things that uh, has been mentioned is the vaccine. I personally think vaccine is the way to go, mm -hmm. to have a long-term solution. Mm -hmm. But then again, remember that we invested so much we even had a 42-page guidelines from the government, which we invested in. We had to uh, set up our washing uh, sinks at the entrance in the restaurant. We had to comply in everything. But then again, we are still being shut down. One of the things that Mweshimua has mentioned, that in supermarkets, people wear masks. But at the restaurant, people don't wear masks. But of course, people are eating. Mm -hmm. So there's no data that shows that the COVID cases are increasing because clients are sitting in restaurants. Mm -hmm. There's no data that supports that. Okay. So are you that, that is very unfair to target mm -hmm. a specific uh, industry. Okay. Are you confident then that we can continue eating from your restaurant without necessarily, uh, you know, spreading COVID-19? Or in other words, can we contain the spread of COVID-19 without necessarily perhaps reducing your business hours? I'm very confident that we've taken all the measures. First of all, we reduced our sitting capacity to 50%. So at no point will we have cases spreading at the restaurant because one of the things that you have to understand, restaurant keeps the highest standard of hygiene across board. And Mohammed Halsey will agree with me on that. Mm -hmm. We always set set our standards at the international level. So I'm very certain that things are okay and you are all welcome to Cafe Daily and we are, be sure that everything is going to be taken care of. Okay. Let me go back to the, the CAS now. Mr. Karanja, I'm sure the entire country and even the panelists are, um, who have been in this discussion are all, are all watching for what you have to say. Uh, there are those who are looking for assurance that things will get better. There are those who are looking for assurance that their government is indeed caring. And you know, there are those who are looking for assurance that perhaps even though we know the curfew will end on May 29th, perhaps the lockdown issues may be lifted earlier because the president said it's until further notice. Just give us your closing remarks with regards to the way forward, uh, Mr. Karanja. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, the first thing I would say about this pandemic is that uh, uh, none of us is safe yeah. until all of us are safe. And therefore, it is the responsibility of each and every one of us to ensure that we take maximum care of ourselves and, uh, and our loved ones so that we can bring uh, this pandemic or this the spread of the third wave uh, to, to an end. However, it is a duty of the government to create a conducive environment for our business because government doesn't do business. Mm -hmm. What it does is to facilitate uh, trade. And uh, as His Excellency, the President said, the containment uh, measures issued uh, three weeks ago were not to targeting to punish a specific sector. Nobody was being targeted. The intention was to uh, was to reduce the infection rate. And uh, as soon as uh, and you have seen in the last honestly in the last ten days it has gone down from twenty two to yesterday at around fourteen percent. Mm -hmm. And uh, globally they say five percent. Uh, the, 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 when it's below five percent, you can say uh, it's not very, very, very risky. Therefore, uh, this is something which is being watched and evaluated on daily basis. And as soon as we reach the uh, the, the the necessary or uh, the, the the global standards or the global levels, then we shall look at it and see what uh, measures can be or what content measures can be isn't to enable people continue doing their business. Uh, the, the, his Excellency, the, the, the Gazette notice was issued, of course, last week saying uh, it's for 60 days, but that is not cast on stones. If we are able to evaluate and see that uh, we are doing very well, then there is no reason why we should not ease in the containment uh, measures. Okay. The other issue is about the vaccination, which has been raised, and yeah. the vaccination is going on very well. I'm happy because initially, remember, there was some. Uh, resistance but right now the people are really going for the vaccine and uh, we have the government has made arrangements to bring in more vaccine for so that we can continue vaccinating more and more and more people because we know even for those countries which are opening up it is upon reaching a certain degree a certain percentage of vaccination and they say now we feel we are safe we can open up therefore the government is putting all putting all effort and measures Possible to ensure that we vaccinate as many people as possible, especially the front train and those who are vulnerable. Okay. But the, 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 what my parting shot is this: there is the, the, the measures which were put uh, about uh, two weeks ago or three weeks ago were not meant to punish, and they are subject to review as soon as we are uh, the, 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 the intended uh, the, 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 the results uh, are achieved. That is when the infection rate. Could uh, get to a certain level, then the 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 the, 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 the government will evaluate, and if possible, we shall open up. Uh, we shall uh, we shall lift the restriction. Okay. Thank you. Bona Hersi, on behalf of the tourism industry, in just one minute, your parting shot. I think on behalf of the industry, I would like to thank uh, the domestic traveller. I would like to thank Kenyans and the residents for the support they've given us. People say that uh, we consider the domestic market to be our fallback plan. They are not our fallback plan. It is our plan A. Yeah, and okay. it's a serious segment. And I just want to thank them wholeheartedly for the support they've always given us. And we hope that once the session of movement is lifted, we look forward for them to start traveling again and reassure them on that uh, we practice very strict uh, protocols to handle COVID-19. And we've invested immensely in that area. And we just want to confirm to everybody that, yes, Kenya is a safe destination okay. when it comes to COVID matches. And rest assured that we'll put our best foot forward. We miss them in our hotels, in our resorts, and everywhere. Mm -hmm. And we look forward to have them fly again, travel again, drive themselves, and so that the economy can go back to what we usually do, so that we can also pay taxes and keep our government going. Thank As you very much. Asante. Tony Watima, we lost millions of job la jobs last year. We l so many businesses were closed. The economy actually slumped into recession. Mm -hmm. How do you prevent another 2020 in your parting shot? I think uh, at this point in time, we'll have to look at the budget. I think the budget has been tabled, should be this week, uh, in Parliament. 
uh, we should expect a budget that uh, aligns with the reality on what we are facing today. And so uh, we need to see interventions of government from uh, that angle of the budget because that's where government intervenes. Uh, but so far, so what we've seen from the budget policy statement, you don't see that. Mm -hmm. uh, so it means that Kenyans are on their own. That's the biggest problem that we have. Uh, and so that my parting shot is that as parliamentarians look at that b budget, I think they should try to rework on it that it, it addresses the reality that we live in today. All right. That's a good point to uh, close our conversation today. We've been talking about COVID-19 and the economy and how, of course, we can continue uh, growing our economy and prevent our, I mean, the, of course, the tragic situation that we found ourselves in 2020. Many thanks to my guests, of course, Magdalene Moiruri, the general manager of Cafe Deli, Lawrence Karanja, the industrialization uh, and trade chief administrative secretary. Mohamed Ersi is the chairman of the Kenya Tourism Federation, joining us from Mombasa. And of course, here in studio, our almost resident economist, Tony Watima. Having your host, Victor Kiprop. Let's see you again next Monday. Enjoy your weekend.